All right, perfect. And Suzanne, I'm going to make you a co-host too. I'm sorry about that. Thank perfect. You. All right. Welcome everybody. We'll give everybody just a, a couple of short minutes to get get joined here. Um, all right. So we always ask our panelists what they are currently reading because we're, we're we're a school that loves loves reading, loves literature. Um, so now I have to remember what what am I reading? I I just started this morning Jenny by Sigrid Unset, which is very interesting so far. And I also, uh, on the spiritual side, just got uh, Father Sebastian Walsh's book on St. Joseph, um, The Man Closest to Christ. So very much looking looking forward to that. But I still have to finish um, St. John Paul II's Letter to Families, which is also also very edifying. So balancing. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Padre. Uh, Susanna, what are you reading right now? I am currently reading Jane Eyre, which is very good. I'm only reading Fantastic. 10 chapters in maybe, but really enjoying it. Fantastic. Great. That's, that's an Hello, intense Sam, by the way. Nice to meet you. You too. Uh, and so Padre Edmund, what, what, what have you been reading? I just finished <laughs> reading Waverly by Sir Walter Scott. Awesome. It's fantastic. It was the first time I'd read it, um, but I loved it. So I, obviously, I, Ivanhoe is of great fame. What do you love most about of, of his work that you've read so far? Waverly is my favorite that I've read so far. That's great. Um, I have not had the pleasure. I'll it's the first. Fun. It's his first novel. Um, nice. And it's very. It has this characteristic love of detail and going off on tangents, um, <laughs> but in a very charming way. As I read, I read Ivanhoe every year for for class. We still do that, Father Ryan, for liter literature. Um, How's in your class? <laughs> it's great. It's so good. And I have to say, though, Ivanhoe every year does get a little bit old. Um, reading all the the detail, um, <laughs> as opposed to Emma, which does not get old when I read it every single year. I still love Ivanhoe. I still love it. Well, thank you, Father Edmund. Uh, Sister Anne, welcome. Uh, I'll do some intros in just a second, but Sister Anne, what are you reading right now? No, I am uh, reading a book on Fatima, on Fatima awesome. apparitions. So I'm getting ready uh, to go to World Youth Day in, at the end of July, beginning of August. So I'm, you know, getting getting myself ready. Um, so it's that's gonna, amazing. Yeah, it's been a lovely read. Oh, that's going to be, what a, what a pleasure. I'm so glad. Are you leading a, a group from a local, a, a local uh, school or who are you going with? Yeah, that's a great question. So many of our sisters are bringing their students, but uh, my current role is to assist in the vocation office. So we're right. kind of going as as a vocation office. So there'll be about six sisters with us um, total, uh, and we'll go. Um, yeah, we'll have like a vocation booth and things like that, and yeah, kind of fantastic. Well, that's of great. <laughs> uh, Patra Edmund, are you going to World Youth Day at all? I'm not, but uh, one of my confers is um, fantastic. So if you see if you see someone dressed like this, you can. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, Father Ryan, so first of all, are you going to, to World Youth Day and what are you reading? <laughs> I'm not going to World Youth Day, unfortunately. Um, there is a big group from my diocese going though, so nice. a friend of mine is leading them. But I am reading a couple things. I just bought a bunch of these. for. Uh, it's called Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. Great. And it's it's about authentic masculinity. So I'm hoping to start like a a little book club with some of the men of the parish to read this together awesome. um and then uh on my own i'm also reading just uh the the new well a couple of years old the complete works from uh from charles de Koenig. i've been reading ego ah, sapiencia great. on on our lady yeah so it's been very good fantastic well that covers some really good areas well thank you guys so much for sharing we've got a good group here so let's get started um I will do some brief introductions and then Patra Evan, you can lead us in prayer. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to welcome Sister Ann Thomas. She is originally from Long Island, New York, and it's nice to have heard a little bit about you, your background a little bit. Uh, but Sister Ann entered the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia in August of 2011 and made her perpetual profession of vows on July 24th of 2018. So you're almost at five, five years. That's right. Well, congratulations, really. Uh, sister taught high school um, for several years after having received her Bachelor of Science degree from Aquinas College in Nashville, Tennessee. 
And she is currently serving as the vocation assistant for her community, supporting the work of the vocation director in promoting vocations. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Sister Anne. Uh, Padre Edmund Wallstein. Padre Edmund is a Cistercian monk. He's a lecturer in moral theology and the director of the Janos Brenner House in Austria. He is also a, a very excellent author. If you get a chance to read any of his books, I've got, I've got a couple of them, a couple of them back here, Padre Edmund. Uh, he studied at Thomas Aquinas College uh, and the Hochschule Benedict XVI and the University of Vienna. Uh, and what's very interesting is that I know this is a new thing for you, Pater Edmund, the Janos Brenner House is a house of discernment for students at their theological college. So studying theology, but discerning the religious life or priesthood. Uh, so that'll be very interesting to hear your thoughts today. And last but certainly not least, Father Ryan Truss. Uh, Father Truss was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of St. Louis in 2021, where he now serves as an associate pastor at Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Valley Park, Missouri. Father is a 2011 graduate of Mother Divine Grace School, as well as a former student of mine and a former teacher for MODG. That feels like forever ago, Father Ryan, probably because it, it was forever ago. <laughs> <laughs> he then, after MODG, studied at Thomas Aquinas College in California before returning home to Missouri to enter the seminary. In his free time, Father Truss enjoys anything outdoors, as you can guess from his uh, uh, authentic masculinity, vote of confidence, <laughs> camping, kayaking, hunting. That was the case when we were in college, too. Uh, or sitting down by the river reading St. Thomas and enjoying being a priest, of course. Well, thank you all so much for being with us here today. Uh, and I will kick it over to you, Pater Edmund. Would you be able to start us off with a prayer? Yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, we implore thee, let thy inspiration precede our actions, and thy help further them, so that all our prayers and all our deeds may ever take their beginning from thee, and so begun, may through thee reach completion. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. All yours, Susanna. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for being here today. Um, to start us off, I'd just like to ask you guys about your vocation journeys. Um, so, Father Tress, could you start us off with your story and tell us about your journey before and after college and how you realized that God was calling you to the diocesan priesthood? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Well, mine is a fairly simple story in that, you know, I, I don't know, I can't really even remember a first moment when I felt the call to become a priest because it just kind of slowly grew. I remember, you know, being five years old and <laughs> on the school bus, it was funny. They were making fun of us, um, you know, so-and-so like so-and-so and all this, you know, and we were, me and my friend, Andrew, we were like, nope, we're going to become priests. <laughs> so you can't make fun of us. <laughs> but no, it definitely grew after that. I remember um, receiving my first Holy Communion and, and just really being filled with this desire to bring the Eucharist to others as a priest. Um, and then, you know, as I got older, we moved down to St. Louis and there was a summer camp at the seminary each year that I would go to and be with the seminarians, um, praying together and celebrating the mass, but then also having fun with the, with the priests and the seminarians. Um, so I think it just kind of slowly grew. And then I, uh, in Mother Divine Grace, um, really fell in love with the, the study of, of philosophy and theology. <laughs> uh, even in that, you know, I, I think the very first class I took was the humanities class with James Berquist. And that just kind of ignited a, a part of me, you know, I guess um, to, to really pursue the truth. And, um, and so, yeah, I was at the time, I think probably planning on going to seminary after high school, uh, which I did homeschool through high school. I was in kindergarten and through second grade at a Catholic school, but then homeschooled most of the rest of my life. Um, and, uh, you know, remember, um, yeah, just, uh, deciding to go to Thomas Aquinas College to pursue um, the great books and uh, just really enjoyed Mother Divine Grace and the way that we discuss things in Mother Divine Grace. And so I decided to go there for college. And while I was there, I continued to, to pray. Um, and, and I guess also seeing so many good examples of the chaplains there at TAC. You know, we had 
a Dominican, we had a Norbertine, we had a diocesan, we had a Jesuit. And so I also kind of expanded my horizons a little bit because as a child, all I really knew was the diocesan priesthood. Um, and so in college, I looked at different orders and things too, but kept my heart, kept going back to the diocese. Uh, you know, just, I think there's a real sense of spiritual fatherhood that a diocesan priest is able to have because he's there with his family, with his parish, um, hopefully for a long time. Uh, you know, sometimes assignments are short, maybe two or three years, but, but sometimes they last for 30 years or more. <laughs> Uh, and you really get to build those relationships with your spiritual family. And uh, I think that's just how I really always felt the call. Um, in college, it wasn't as though I was just like single-minded heading towards the priesthood. I definitely uh, thought of marriage and, uh, you know, I think saw the beauty of marriage through the um, through the very holy marriages of many of the tutors there. And um, just, uh, but but at the end of the day, just really felt that call to the priesthood. So I uh, applied to the seminary during my senior year at TAC and uh, received my uh, my acceptance letter actually on Holy Thursday. I remember being at TAC, going to the mailbox on Holy Thursday and got my acceptance letter. So I thought that was a beautiful, not just a coincidence, you know, that that was the day on which the priesthood was, was instituted by Christ, the Last Supper. Um, so after TAC, came back here to St. Louis to Kenrick Glennon Seminary and um, I was here for five years, uh, and just a great experience. I think I realized that seminary formation is not just about academics, although that's part of it. I thought it would just be a breeze. I thought, you know, I mean, after being at TAC, I really enjoyed diving into the, um, intellectual life, and that was part of seminary. <laughs> um, um, maybe I wish it had been a bit a bigger part of seminary, but it wasn't a huge part in St. Louis, um, but, what I really did grow in was the human formation and the spiritual formation in the seminary. Um, and I think it really was good for me. I think I was kind of a, uh, kind of a nerdy jerk at times <laughs> when I entered the seminary <laughs> and, uh, it kind of helped soften the edges and just make me able to, to better serve the Lord and be a bridge. A priest is meant to be a bridge between God and his people. And we don't want our, humanity to obstruct the bridge, but to actually be the bridge. Um, so I think seminary was, was really good for me. Five years there, and then was ordained two years ago. Uh, as a deacon, my diaconate ordination was was sad. It was kind of under cover of night. I felt like John Paul II, you know, we uh, were kind of clandestine. We weren't supposed to gather more than 10 of us because <laughs> of COVID, right? And uh, so the Archbishop, um, there are a few more than 10, not not many more than 10, but uh, we had to have a few more than 10 to have the ordination. We were in this huge cathedral, so I think we were okay. Um, I hope we don't get reported now that this is public, but <laughs> I felt like John Paul II uh, sort of, you know, flying under the radar, getting ordained um, as a deacon, uh, and then a priest the next year. Luckily, that was more open. We were able to invite friends and family to that ordination, so um yeah that's uh then i've been here at uh, a pretty large parish in st louis uh sacred heart parish and it's been a real blessing i've been very involved in the school and in the youth group and in ministering we got six nursing homes right around us so i'm over there a lot too uh so the young and the old uh, it's been just a, a beautiful time uh of life just to 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 be able to bring christ to his people so Thank you That's so much story. for sharing that. That's really beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Um, next, Potter Edmund, could you please share a little about your vocation story as well and what drew you to become a Cistercian monk? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was homeschooled. I actually did some, some courses for Mother of Divine Grace, but I wasn't enrolled. <laughs> um, but uh, we were living in Austria. My father was teaching at a theological institute in Austria, the ITI, International Theological Institute. Um, and I would serve mass for the chaplain of the ITI, um, who was a Swiss priest, his name was Don Reto Nai. And um, I was very impressed by his reverence when he was celebrating mass. Uh, it was clear that he, 
was putting his whole being into it that he really believed that this was the sacrifice of Christ. Um, and so that sort of uh, awakened the, my desire to be a priest at first. Um, but then I got to know the Cistercian Monastery, Stift Heiligenkreuz, where I eventually entered. Um, and it was, it was through getting to know that particular monastery that uh, my desire to become a Cistercian monk was aroused. I was just very moved uh, by the beauty of the divine office in that monastery, especially. Um, the, the chanting um, in the beautiful Abbey Church. The monastery was founded in the year 1133, and uh, the nave of the church is the first thing they built. It's, it's from the 12th century. Um, and um, yes, but then I went to TAC. Uh, and it was about, it was halfway through my studies at Thomas Aquinas College that I actually decided to enter the monastery. I was visiting in this, during the summer vacation, I was visiting the monastery. And I witnessed two monks make their final uh, profession of vows. And after that, um, I said, that's what I want for myself. So, uh, I, uh, I spoke to the prior and to the abbot of the monastery. Um, and St. Benedict says in his rule that if, if someone comes to the monastery and wants to join, don't open the door right away. Let him wait outside for a few days and knock. So this, that's what the abbot did. He said, well, finish college first. So I did two more years of TUC. Um, and then when those two years were done, I entered the monastery. I graduated in 2006 in May, and in August of 2006, I, was, I received the habit as a Cistercian novice. Um, and then I took my, my simple vows the next year. So we take simple vows for three years. Uh, and then after those three years, so in 2010, I took solemn vows. Um, and the day after I took solemn vows, I was ordained to the diaconate. And then one year later, I was ordained to the priesthood. So 2011, I was ordained to priest. Thank you so much. That's so beautiful. I love hearing about all the different stories. Thank you. All right, and then last but certainly not least, <laughs> Sister Ann Thomas, would you please tell us a little about your vocation journey and what led you to enter the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia? Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, just say I'm a little, my background, I grew up um, in a Catholic, Catholic family, a faithful family, um, but uh, the faith wasn't really my own till I um, went to high school. That's when I really had this kind of deep uh, conversion experience and experience with the Eucharist uh, that transformed my life. <laughs> and so I was a little more, um, started to be a little bit more attentive uh, to the working of, of the Holy Spirit and the Lord in my life. Um, growing up, I didn't know religious, really. Um, I think I had a, a vague conception of, of religious sisters, and I, I'm sorry to say that my kind of uh, impression was that you had to be 80, kind of mean, maybe a little weird. Um, <laughs> that, that's kind of all I knew of religious, unfortunately. Um, but when I um, when I was in high school, I, again, was, was starting to grow closer to the Lord, and I started to seek him out and, and just opportunities to grow in my faith. So uh, my freshman year, I had gone to some sort of um, like youth event, youth rally retreat, and there was a sister there uh, who spoke, and she was like the complete opposite of my conception of a religious sister, right? So here was this young sister who was normal, kind of funny, um, but more than anything else, she had this deep uh, peace and joy about her that I hadn't really experienced, encountered in anyone. Um, so I was so struck by her. Um, her peace, her joy, and and her life. You know, I just was like, what's her what's her deal? I just didn't like get her. <laughs> um, you know, and and so that kind of seed was planted, I think, then uh, for my vocation. Um, but I just kind of I pushed that idea totally out of my mind, out of my heart. That was not something that I was gonna do. Uh, I'm not gonna. I don't need to think about that. That's that's not on my radar at all. Um, and I really kind of pushed it away. Um, but as I was um, growing um, in, in my relationship with the Lord, I, again, was starting to seek him um, more in prayer, and 
um, yeah, the thought of religious life just kept coming up. Um, yeah, certainly in my prayer, uh, it, at, you know, at, or at mass, I'd, you know, hear the gospel, go, so all that you have and follow me. And I, I knew that the Lord was, was speaking to me or, um, yeah, these, these sisters would come into to my life kind of randomly, um, but, the, but the Lord was using all of that. And, you know, at, during that time, I was just, yeah, seeking him more and, and actually started to want to do his will. And I realized that he had a plan for my life. Um, so I started to just genuinely ask, like, Lord, what is it that you are, are calling me to? Um, and uh, more and more religious life just kept coming up. And so I knew that that was something that I, I clearly needed to take a look at. Um, and so the more I learned about religious life, uh, the more I spent time with sisters, the more I was drawn to it and realized that I, that I actually had a desire for it, that the Lord had given me that desire uh, for religious life that I didn't even know I had. Um, and so I had a, a teacher in high school who I was just kind of asking some questions, um, you know, about, about religious life, um, because I knew she had uh, just, yeah, known sisters and things like that. And she, she had given me the website to our community. And so I, you know, I looked it up, looked us up and, um, yeah, I was just so struck and drawn, uh, by the Dominican charism. Um, and so things that I was really drawn to, uh, there are two mottos that, that we have, uh, we have many, but two that I was really particularly drawn to. The first one is veritas, that is truth, right? Um, first, that, that there is a truth, right? Um, uh, and, and we are, are called as Dominicans to, to preach the truth, truth of the, the gospel, the truth of the human person, the truth of Jesus Christ, right? Dominic found the order at a time where all those things were questioned and there was confusion about that. And looking around, um, that's still the case today, <laughs> I think we could say. And so, um, yes, that's that, that just that mission to, to preach the truth for the salvation of souls was really, um, yeah, attractive to me. The second model that I, that I love that we have is to contemplate and to share with others the fruits of contemplation or that which is contemplated. And I, um, you know, first and foremost, our life is one of prayer and union with God. But then from that comes the apostolic life, right? To go out and, and to preach um, that which we contemplated, but whom we've contemplated. Um, so all, all that was kind of go going on in my mind, in my heart uh, during my high school years. But um, while I was drawn to religious life, I was also drawn to marriage and family. And so uh, my senior year, I was, I was dating this young man and he had a great relationship, good guy. Um, but there was just something in my heart that I just like couldn't do it because my heart, I realized that my heart was made for something else and it was made um, for the Lord alone to give myself um, exclusively to him. And so um, while I was pretty sure that the, the Lord was calling to me to religious life and I had this desire for the life, it wasn't exactly clear where I should go, what I should do. I had encountered our sisters, you know, I kind of knew our, of our sisters, but um, how the Lord was leading me just one step at a time, it was just to do the next natural thing, which was to go um, to college. So I did two years at Franciscan University. I loved my time there. It was amazing. I grew so much. Um, and throughout that time, that just the desire for the religious life just kept getting stronger um, and stronger. And the Lord kept putting our sisters, um, like on my heart, my mind, and like in my life, <laughs> that um, it was kind of. Uh, kind of a no-brainer in some ways and so when the sisters kept coming up and uh, yeah I did it was really going to visit that I knew okay this was the place for me uh, so I would visited a few other uh, communities and they had, they had a beautiful life beautiful charism um, but when I visited our sisters it was just like being at home um, everything about it just, just fit you know um of course, there, there are these kind of um, external things that I was really drawn to, yes, the, the choral recitation of the office, the, the study, the, uh, the prayer, um, yeah, even, even the patronage of St. Cecilia that we have, um, those things and, and many more. But um, really, when, um, when the Lord gives a charism to someone, I think uh, when that person encounters the charism, there's a, a sort of resonance. And it becomes even deeper than some of these external things. So really, when I went to visit, um, it just felt like home. So praise God, here I am almost 12 years later, and it's better than anything I could have ever imagined. Thank you so much, sister. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, a part of each of your stories was that you chose to enter a specific order, um, or in your case, Father tries to become a diocesan priest, like you all had talked about. Um, so I just wanted to ask what a typical day looks like for you, and then you both mentioned this, Potter Edmund and Sister Ann Thomas, but whether the charisms and daily routine were a part of how God drew you to that order. Um, so Father Trust, could you start us off with what a typical day looks like for you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Maybe that's the difference. I don't really have a typical day. <laughs> I mean, there's certain things in a, in a, in a parish that are, that are every day, you know, mass every day at 6.30 or 8 o'clock, depending on which week it is. We alternate between the, the pastor and I. Um, prayer in the morning, I try to pray between those two masses. Uh, and then after that, it could be anything. It could be uh, teaching in the school. I do a lot of teaching in our parish school here. Um, I usually celebrate a mass a couple times a week at a nursing home. Uh, and then after that mass, I'll go around and bring communion to those who are bound to their rooms and anointing of the sick and hearing confessions. And um, I guess uh, then, you know, after that, come back. Uh, the middle afternoon is kind of the, the freest time. Uh, in the parish. Uh, so um, in the middle afternoon, that's kind of when I have a little bit of time to myself to maybe do a little reading or um, get some exercise in or um, take a nap some days. <laughs> uh, but then uh, around five or six o'clock is when things kind of start ramping up again and different meetings in the evenings, whether that's youth ministry or uh, we have a, a chastity group here that we just got started at the parish for men. Um, you know, we've got, I don't know, it seems like every, every night there's something different. If I look at my schedule, um, there's different parish organizations and uh, things that I can be involved in. Uh, but then as far as, you know, on the weekends, I, or even through the week, it's, it's true what you hear about how a, a, a priest kind of experiences the whole of life in a single day. So, um, you know, next, next Saturday, I'll have a funeral and then I'll have, uh, or actually I start with the mass with the parish and then I'll have confessions and then I'll have a funeral and then I'll have a wedding <laughs> and then um, then I'll probably help with communion at the evening mass even though I don't have that one so you, you, you experience in one day often being with someone at the side of their bed as they are as they're brought home to heaven um, you know uh, there's been several really beautiful experiences of being with with souls as they depart from this world. Uh, I remember the first one still very clearly. I was just newly ordained a priest and I was called an emergency call late at night to go um, to the man to his bedside and his family was all there. And I was still trying to figure out the the book with the anointing of the sick and the prayers of commendation. And so I, I did the anointing of the sick but I was trying to find the page with the apostolic pardon, which is a beautiful prayer that releases the soul from all punishments in this life and the next. Um, that's part of the words of it there. And I was flipping around trying to find it. I couldn't find it. So I did a litany of saints. I found that, um, did some other little prayers. Then I finally found it. And as I was praying those words, I release you from all punishments in this life and the next. He breathed his last breath. And he went to heaven, you know, um, and so that was just really uh, a moving experience. But that's um, that's something that happens a lot. Just and then might go from that to to baptizing a little baby and experiencing the joy uh, with with the mom and dad as they welcome a new child into the world. But um, yeah, it's a it's a, it, it's no no. There's not a really a typical day because there's all kinds of things that come and go. But I think it is important to have certain things that are. Uh, non-negotiables, you know, uh, setting time aside for prayer, both um, just mental prayer, but then also, of course, we make the promise to pray the liturgy of the hours, just like these religious do, although we are usually doing it just on our own. <laughs> uh, we don't have, sadly, the, the beauty of chanting it with our brothers and sisters, um, but but yeah, it's that's a, a, as typical as you can get. <laughs> No, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, Potter Edmund, could you tell us a little bit more about the life and charisms of the Cistercians as well, and then anything else that drew you to that order? Yeah, sure. Um, 
The Cistercians follow the rule of St. Benedict. And so we're also like Benedictines in the sense that each monastery is, uh, is very much independent of, of the other ones. And so Cistercian life varies a lot from one monastery to another, um, especially now after so many centuries have passed since our founding, various monasteries have developed in different ways. So there's some there's some Cistercian monasteries that are very uh, that are very enclosed. The monks never leave the monastery; they just stay in silence and contemplation. Um, in fact, we now have two Cistercian orders. There's my order, the Order of Cito, and then there's uh, the so-called Trappists, the Order of Cito of the Strict Observance, um, and they the Trappists. Uh, they're all very enclosed in their monasteries, very contemplative, a lot of silence. Um, but my order, the, also called the common observance of the Cistercian order, we are a little more mixed. We have more um, active apostolate in addition to contemplation. So in my monastery, the, the, basic, the basic order of the day is at 5.15 in the morning, we have matins. Um, which lasts about 50 minutes. Uh, then at six o'clock, we have lots. Um, and we chant the whole office in Latin um, using the old Cistercian chant, which is similar to Roman chant. They're just small details that are different. Like it's similar actually to Dominican chant. Same sort of small variations they get in Dominican chant from the Roman chant. Um, and then on weekdays, mass is right after lots, around uh, 6.30, um, the, the community mass. And then uh, after mass, um, there is a period of time for work or for study. So at the moment, I'm, I'm teaching theology at our seminary um, and also at another school nearby. Uh, so, during that time in the morning, I'm usually uh, teaching or preparing for teaching or writing or uh, answering emails or whatever. Um, and then uh, at 12 o'clock, we have two of the little hours, terse and sext. Um, and then we have lunch. And the meals in the monastery are very ceremonial. It's like a liturgy. We have a, a different parts of the monastery built at different times, and the refectory where we have our meals. It was decorated in the Baroque period, so it's very ornate, lots of color and decoration pictures. Um, and we sit at tables that look almost like altars. They're wood, but they're sort of carved to look like Baroque altars. We only sit on one side of the table. There are two rows of tables. Uh, and the servers come between the two tables to serve the food. And then there's someone up in a pulpit reading a, a reading while we eat. Um, it's great. Uh, <laughs> um, and then after lunch, we have a procession back to the church. And during the procession, we sing uh, the Misioneres, Psalm 50 or 51, depending on how you count. Um, have mercy on me, God. And then when we arrive in the church, um, we have a commemoration of the dead, where the names of all the monks who died on that day throughout the centuries, not only from our monastery, but also from a few other monasteries where we have kind of a prayer deal with them. They pray for our dead and we pray for theirs. All those names are read out. Uh, and then we sing this song, De Profundis, Out of the Depths I Cry to you, Lord, for them. Then after the De Profundis, we sing Non, which is the, the next of the little hours of the divine office. Um, then after Non, um, most of us take a nap. Uh, in the rule, uh, it's only we're only required to take a nap in the during the summertime, but I take a nap all through the year. <laughs> this is my zeal in obeying the rule. <laughs> I even take the nap in the in the winter time when it's not required. But uh, <laughs> after taking a nap, then there's another period in the afternoon for for work or study. 
Then at six o'clock we have vespers, um, which is the most solemn part of the of the divine office. Then supper. Then after supper we have what's called recreation, which is basically free time. We sit around and talk basically. Um, and then after recreation we have what's called the collation, which literally means a supper, but it's a it's a not a second material supper, but it's a kind of spiritual supper. It's a reading from the rule of Saint Benedict. Uh, and then after the collation, we go back into church for Compline, which is the last um, prayer of the day, um, which always ends with the Salve Regina, sung according to the, the Cistercian chant, which is uh, of the, it's even more, more ornate than the solemn Roman chant of the Salve Regina. And we sing it all through the year. So even now during the Easter season, in, in the Roman use, you would sing the Regina Celi after Compline. We sing the Regina Celi after Vespers, but we sing the Salve Regina after Compline. The, the last words of the Salve Regina are supposedly, were supposedly added to it by St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who is the greatest Cistercian saint. He was, uh, the Pope had sent him to Germany to get recruits for the Second Crusade. Um, and he was in the cathedral in Speyer in Germany. And they sang the Salve Regina, and then in a kind of ecstasy, he added the last lines of it, O Clemens, O Pia, O Dulcis Virgo Maria. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I had never heard that before. That's really beautiful. Thank you. And then Sister Anne Thomas, and then you talked a little bit about the charisms before, but could you tell us about like what a typical day looks like for you and anything else about the life of your order? Oh, thank you. Um, to, to some degree, the, the uh, Dominicans are also a monastic uh, community, a lot of monastic customs. So some things are, will be similar to what Patra Edmund mentioned. Um, I just thought I'd, I'd say that, of course, St. Dominic founded the order in um, the 13th century. But our community, our Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia, were founded in Nashville, Tennessee here um, in, um, in, in 1860. Um, and so uh, just just to mention that, um, and we're uh, yeah under the patronage of Saint Cecilia. So there's a little um, kind of each Dominican community has a little little flavor to it. And so um, Saint Cecilia being our patroness, we have a particular um, yeah love of and devotion to music and the fine arts. Um, you know, recognizing that anything that is true, good, and beautiful leads us to truth, goodness, and beauty himself. So I'm um, just kind of by way of introduction, I thought I'd mention that. Um, but a typical day in the life of a National Dominican, we wake up at 5 a.m. We're in the chapel by 5.30. We have a, a period of um, uh, uh, silent adoration or um, meditation followed by lauds, uh, then mass, the holy sacrifice of the mass. Um, uh, Dominican life is very, very liturgical um, as, uh, you know, for many religious. And of course, mass is a high point uh, of the day. Um, and then after mass, a uh, quick breakfast, and then the sisters are all off um, to, to the schools to teach. Uh, we're, the sisters are mostly uh, teachers. Um, I right now I'm assisting in the vocation office. So I'm not currently teaching, but I taught high school history for a number of years. And um, yeah, so the sisters who are off to the, the schools are, are on their way there. The sisters who are in studies and formation, they'll take classes here at the mother house or at our school, Aquinas College, uh, maybe about 10, 15 minutes down the road. Um, if you're home at midday, we have um, some devotional prayers. Um, you know, obviously the sisters who are at school are, are, are doing their, um, all their duties there. We're all back together. Uh, by five o'clock. Before Vespers, we have a period of um, adoration. The sisters are, um, are, 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 you know, we have an opportunity to pray in front of our um, Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Um, in the morning, we also have a period of adoration. The sisters who are retired, um, they now have an apostolate of prayer, and they spend uh, their mornings um, praying for for the apostolate, for the sisters out, the sisters and all those whom we serve uh, in the apostolate in the morning. So by five o'clock, we're back together in the chapel for Vespers, followed by uh, the rosary. After um, the rosary, we have dinner. And similar to what Pater Edmund say, we, we eat together um, in, in, a, in the refectory in, in silence uh, we're, while we're listening to something uh, being read to us. So 
idea is that we're being fed physically, but also uh, spiritually during that time. Um, after um, dinner, then we have a period of recreation where we're all uh, together, kind of like family time, play games, talk, a uh, little craft during that time. But um, it's a time to be together and to foster that community life, uh, which is so um, important in our uh, religious life. Followed uh, after recreation, we were back in the chapel for a period of spiritual reading and then um, compline. And of course, we have our Dominican Salve that we end with. Um, uh, every night in a hymn to um, St. Dominic of the Old Women. And that all kind of wraps up uh, by um, 8, 10. And the sisters have um, some free time to um, pray, to rest, um, usually to get ready for the next school day, grade some papers, things like that. And um, we're all kind of in our, in our cells uh, by 10 p.m. Um, we're, when there's profound silence in the house. Um, so yeah, our day is filled with um, yeah, kind, of, kind of this this mixed life, this this um, time to contemplate, but then also time to go um, and kind of spread what we've received in contemplation. So we have periods of silence and and not in, um, in the house. Thank you so much. That's such a beautiful routine. Thank you. Um, so for the last bit of questions here before we move on to the Q&A pod, um, I know a lot of students are starting to think about their vocation and might not really be sure how to prepare or how to learn to discern God's will in their life. Um, so I just wanted to ask, what are some practical, sorry, practical steps to prepare for and discern your vocation, learning how to listen to God's voice that high school students can implement right now? And Father Trust, would you start us off again? Okay. Yeah, I, I could I could talk for an hour on this, so I'll try to keep it short so that you guys can also uh, say some things here. But of course, as, as I'm sure each of you would say, prayer is number one. Uh, spending time with our Lord in prayer, that's where you receive a supernatural calling. Um, I think something I learned, uh, I think it might have been Father Sebastian Walsh who said this, which is the book that Chris Sebastian had there, um, is that in a way there's a natural vocation we all have to marriage, just in the sense that Jesus or I'm sorry, or God in Genesis says to be fruitful and multiply. So there's going to be a natural desire that every person has to marriage, uh, but the calling to be a priest or a religious is a supernatural vocation above and beyond uh, the natural uh, vocation. So I think it's it's good to really uh, spend time. That one especially has to be received in prayer, a supernatural vocation. Um, and so uh, I think, though, I would say this, though, uh, if you are praying and stressing out about your vocation, then stop praying about your vocation. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean that in this way, that like um, before we can receive uh, the vocation as a gift, we have to first um, have our hearts in a place where uh, where we are living as sons and daughters of God. Um, you know, uh, before we can become a spiritual mother or a spiritual father, uh, so important to be living as beloved sons and beloved daughters of God. Uh, and I was thinking of a quote from uh, a Cistercian Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, and, and I, I'm probably mixing a couple quotes here together, so maybe Potter Edmund could uh, could say this more precisely. But he says of, of our mother Mary that um, before she conceived our Lord in her womb, she first conceived him in her heart. And at another place, I think he says something like, it was actually a higher honor for her to be uh, a daughter than to be the mother of God, which is pretty amazing to be the mother of, uh, to be first God's daughter, God's daughter. And then in the gift of that identity as a daughter to receive her vocation as the mother of God. So all that to say, as you're praying uh, about your vocation, sometimes we can be very, we can kind of treat God as uh, a bit of a, you know, a vending machine where we put in our time in prayer and we hope to get the answer uh, of where he's calling us. But first, he just wants to love us. He just wants to uh, to, to love us as a father. Um, and so opening our hearts to receiving that love, receiving our identity as beloved sons and beloved daughters. And then in that identity as beloved sons and beloved daughters, he will reveal our vocation. He will give us and we'll be able to receive it as a gift and not as some great trial that that he's giving us to test us but truly as a as a gift um a vocation is meant to be a gift 
And so that's my little uh, two cents worth on discernment. Thank you so much. That's really beautiful. And as everyone's saying in the chat, very helpful. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Potter Edmund, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, the The religious life is is sometimes described as a life according to the evangelical councils. Um, evangelical meaning given us in the gospel, that it's as it were advice that God gives us in the gospel to live. Uh, and often the three that are often named are um, poverty, chastity, and obedience as evangelical councils. And to call it a council means that it's not a commandment. So a vocation to the religious life is not like a private commandment that God gives you that you have to follow. Um, so if you remember the, the story in the gospel where the rich young man is talking to Jesus and he asks what he needs to do to gain eternal life, Jesus says to him, follow the commandments. That's, that's what's required. That's what you have to do. That's not optional. Um, <laughs> but then um, he, he asks what more he can do. And then Jesus says, well, sell everything that you have, give the proceeds to the poor and come and follow me. Um, so that's something that he's inviting the man to. That's a, a, a kind of vocation to the religious life that you could say that that young man is receiving. But it's not a commandment. Um, so uh, I think sometimes, uh, sometimes there's a difficulty in discerning vocation because sometimes people tend to think of it in the wrong way as though it were as though God were going to give them a secret commandment that he's never given anyone else. Um, but that's not exactly true. He's giving you an invitation. Um, and so for me, it was very helpful when I was uh, discerning whether to enter the monastery, um, a saying of St. Augustine, a uh, famous saying, which maybe you've, you've uh, looked at in Latin class, Dilige et quod vis fac, meaning dilige, imperative from diligere, right? Love. Dilige et quod vis fac. Love et, et quod vis and what you will, that is what you want, fac, do. Love and do what you want. Um, this is the, <laughs> the secret of the Christian life. The important thing is to love God above everything, to love him with your heart and soul and with all your strength um, and to love your neighbor as yourself on account of God. And then you can do whatever you want. If you want to enter the monastery, do that. But if you don't, then um, sometimes people think they don't want to enter the monastery, but they kind of think it would be good for them to do. And so they sort of pretend to themselves that it's what they want, but it's not, the, not a good way of doing it. If, if, um, if God wants to, he'll give you the desire to enter the religious life. Because without really wanting to do it, it's not going to be any use to you or to anyone else. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then again, last but certainly not least, Sister Anne, do you have any other advice you'd like to add? I can hardly agree with what uh, Father, uh, Father Edmund and, and Father Ryan said. Um, excellent answers. My only... Um, that I would mention is um, what can happen often is that we really want to know our vocation. And so we're praying, praying so hard about, about it, but um, we actually like, we want to do his will, like the big, his will, but we miss doing his will, like in the moment, because we're so focused on the big vocation question when really, um, yeah, our vocation is really just a means to the end, which is love and, union of, you know, love of God and union with him. And so um, if we're too focused on that, we, we miss actually the, the whole point, <laughs> which is love of God. So, um, but yeah, love God and do, do what you will. Um, really just, I would act, just kind of, um, highlight living in the present moment. Um, and the Lord will, um, he will, will, sh will show you, he will reveal to you. He will invite you, um, when it's, um, according to his timing, which is always perfect. Um, so yeah, just kind of recommend living in, in the present moment and it will all follow from there. Thank you so much, Sister Anne, and thank you all so much for coming today and for sharing this. It's been really beautiful to hear 
I'm going to toss it back over to Mr. Sebastian for the questions and answers now. But thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susanna. Incredible. Thank you all so much. That's so edifying and helpful for me to think about in my uh, vocation as a, as a father and husband as well. Um, on that, and this is these are all going to be slightly related. And please, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to submit them via chat or the Q&A pod. Uh, I'll ask this to all of you, if any of you would like to, to share. Uh, regarding the call to marriage and discerning the two, the two paths, uh, what was that discernment process like as a, on a practical level? Uh, the question ends up being, did dating help with that discernment process? If anyone would like to share or has had that experience. I will say on my part, dating did help. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I, I can say one thing. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really do any dating. I did, when I was a sophomore at uh, TAC, I fell head over heels in love with a girl in my class. Um, uh, but because I already also had the desire to enter the monastery, I didn't, I didn't, uh, yeah. uh, ask her out. Um, mm. but I, I, I sort of was thinking about doing it for a long time, but then she, she started dating someone else. So I said, what the heck, I'm going to the monastery. <laughs> God, that, that invitation was withdrawn. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I think that is, that makes sense to me. If you're talking about the desire, then it is a desire towards something as opposed to the lack of something else. Would, would you all agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I like that. Yeah, very much. So it wasn't only because she jilted me that I answered my Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> After having heard your story, I know no one could doubt that. Uh, so then, two, four, this will be for you, Patra Edmund, and also you, Sister Anne. Um, we heard a little bit of your story, Patra Edmund, about discernment of order. Uh, but did you ever concern, for either of you, did you ever consider another order? And how did you end up finalizing that process? I don't know if I have um, too much more to add than what I kind of already mentioned, but um, I did, um, you know, growing up in New I grew up in New York and there were, there's a lot of beautiful religious in the area, the Sisters of Life, the Little Sisters of the Poor, um, the Franciscan Sisters, um, there, there's so many, and yeah, be beautiful, beautiful charisms, uh, beautiful way of living religious life. Um, and while I could kind of recognize that, there was just something that it wasn't me. Um, and, and really there were things, how the Lord worked in my life is that he, he did draw me to the Dominicans. Um, yeah, like there were these kind of external things that I was really drawn to, right? The, um, the community life, the devotion to Our Lady, the Eucharist, um, the chanting of the divine office, um, uh, the, the, yeah, the uh, communal prayer, the, the emphasis on the intellectual life and study for the sake of salvation of souls. Um, those were things that I was really drawn to, but again, it was, it, visiting was really kind of what, what, um, how the Lord kind of revealed to me that this is the place where I was meant to be. This is where I'm going to be, um, where he, where he wants me to be yeah, most, most fulfilled. Um, to some degree, it's kind of hard to explain in words. Um, maybe you've had this experience with your wife, like how, how, how did you know that she was the one, well, you know, or a lot of couples will say, well, I just, I just knew. Um, yeah. and it's like almost not really a satisfying answer for us who really want to know, yeah. but it, there's a truth to that. Um, yeah. 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 Um, with me, it was, it was actually after I already entered the monastery that I, so, um, when I was in temporary vows, so before you take final vows, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, uh, you take temporary vows and in my monastery, it's three years. So, and before you take the vows, you're, we have one year of novitiate where you haven't taken any vows at all. You can leave at any time. And it was during the novitiate and then again during temporary vows that I thought about switching to a different uh, order. Um, particularly, I thought about going to um, 
a monastery that follows the same rule of St. Benedict, but a little bit more literally, um, because my monastery is very old. There's been lots of developments in the way we live our life since the time of our foundation. And as I mentioned, we have more external apostolate than, uh, than was usual at the foundation of the Cistercian Order. So I thought about that. Um, and I actually visited the, in my last year of temporary vows, I actually visited a few other Benedictine monasteries, uh, including uh, Clear Creek Abbey in, in America, um, and thought about switching there. But um, similar to what Sister was saying, uh, I thought those places were great, but my heart was here. That's beautiful. And, and I will say this going back to what, what Sister Anne was saying too. It is very unfulfilling. It's almost like you make the decisions and, and through prayer, through living a life. Um, I found for myself, I do remember the moment that I, I knew I was going to marry my wife. I remember the restaurant that we were in, which is closed now. Very unfortunate. <laughs> you can't, you can't go there anymore. Um, and it is a lot of work that goes into it behind the scenes and, and an openness to it as a gift. Um, so there's, it's beautiful to see the connections, although a, a natural versus a supernatural call is, as we were saying before. So I, I've got a question then for um, Father Truss. This is a, a bit of a um, philosophical question. So we'll see, see how we can handle this here. Uh, Anna is asking, she says, it seems to me that youth is marked by its enthusiasm and hence its impatience at times. What does the prudential mean between becoming indifferent and careless about our future and worrying about that future from the vocational side? What do you think about that, Father Ryan? Yeah. Well, I, I think just the very name vocation, it means a call. So it's not something that you have to decide for yourself. Thank heavens. It's a call that you receive. And so, I mean, I, I, I think I can really say in principle, don't worry about your vocation. God will reveal it in due time. Um, and so it's not being careless to, I mean, at, but at the same time, like, yeah, that doesn't mean don't um, check out different religious communities or, um, you know, stop. When I, when I said stop praying, of course, that didn't mean, I didn't mean stop praying full mm -hmm. stop. I meant stop praying about this specific vocation if it's something that's stressing you out and it's not maybe where your heart is yet because before you can pray about this particular religious order or this particular diocese or whatnot it, it's so important to simply live in the love of god um and to live in the present moment saying yes to god in all the little ways preparing you to say yes to that bigger yes of a, of a vocation um that's so it's not to you know simply um just like pay no attention to the future, um, but to simply uh, prepare to prepare for that future by living in the present and um, following God's will in the present and then to be ready to receive uh, his call as a gift, mm. whether it's the marriage or to mm -hmm. priesthood or religious life. Uh, it's meant to be a gift. Beautiful. Beautiful. I've got one, one more question and then we'll end. Uh, this is for, for any of you. After having come to that decision that you wanted to join the priesthood or religious life, enter, enter into that, did you experience any, any difficulties, whether spiritual or practical, uh, any roadblocks that uh, you felt, whether it was the devil or the world kept pulling you back? Or have you? how would you recommend that a student having decided that deal with those difficulties? I remember when I, um, when I first spoke to the abbot about entering the monastery, when I drove home after talking to him, I had kind of a panic attack. <laughs> wow. wow. Uh, but I mean, then, as I said, he, he had told me that I had to wait two years anyways. And by the time I actually entered the novitiate, then the day that I was clothed in the habit, I was full of peace and joy. Mm. Wow. 
Father Ryan, did you any, any any roadblocks in your way? A little bit. I mean, there's something also to keep in mind is that the discernment of a vocation uh, is not only yours, but also the church's. Mm -hmm. uh, right? And mm -hmm. so um, whether you enter a monastery or a convent or a seminary, um, you're discerning whether this is your calling and the church represented by your superiors is also discerning from what they can see whether they believe this is your calling and and also trying to form you um formation means really uh it, it just what it says it's it's really should be formative um it's not simply a test but actually a time of formation to mold your heart uh according to the vocation you're receiving and so yeah i would say um this is i kind of joked earlier you know i thought of the seminary just as Kind of a continuing education um, in academics and philosophy theology and uh, it really was a little bit part of that but then mostly it was being formed humanly and spiritually and um, I think part of the yeah there was a my theology one year which was like two years into the seminary um, there were some kind of roadblocks where I think part of it part of it was that I had come from Thomas Aquinas College where uh, where our classes are discussions and yeah. you know you can freely challenge the teacher and you can freely engage in dialogue slash debate uh, and that wasn't received so well in the <laughs> seminary they were like well, who does he think he is <laughs> to ask, you know um and so I I you know and I think then part of it too was just like adapting to you know this kind of classroom setting and uh and so that took a little bit of dying to self. That was just the form it took for me. It, it takes various forms and everybody. And that was just one, one way I had to die to myself was to be like, okay, I'm no longer at TAC. So, and I'm surrounded by guys who, some of them are really engaged in theology and, and would enjoy talking about that over the lunch table. And some of them are just, uh, that's not where their interests are, um, you know? And so I had to kind of, you know, just sort of, uh, I guess realized too, like uh, preparing to be in a parish is different from, you know, as a Cistercian or a Dominican, where you know the the intellectual life is a is a bigger part of your day, um, and so uh, just to be able to come down and just have more casual conversations with the guys, not always be like, hey, so what do you think about what Augustine said there? You know, <laughs> you know that was kind of my go to icebreaker, and you know. I had to, I think that was a place of, 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 of molding that, that I had to undergo. And it was a challenge for a while, for sure. And now, now it's, you have to say, well, what, how, how about those Cardinals? <laughs> yeah. not, not a great year for that. <laughs> not a good year to say that, but no, no, <laughs> there's still time to turn it around. I, I was just talking to a mutual friend of ours, um, or a couple of mutual friends of ours, father, Jeff Hanley and father um, Max Nightingale about what you were saying at the beginning about that discernment both on the church's side and on your side um i had some some friends and some parents who were talking about the priesthood as well we need priests the church needs good religious good good uh people to serve it so if you have the desire we need you need to make that happen uh, you need to just make that a smooth a smooth process um and he was echoing they were both echoing what you were saying that it is a discernment on the other on the on both mm -hmm. sides and you have to have prudence um but it's a re a real thing being called to that diocese that order um that place so thank you for sharing that uh and sister Anne, is there anything that you wanted to to add about that on the spiritual practical roadblocks side of things I was just thinking kind of along the same lines of what you just mentioned and what Father mentioned, um, that um, if the Lord is uh, um, calling you to, to you know, enter the seminary, enter religious life, um, he will make a way for those things to happen. Mm. Um, and so if there are, are difficulties, uh, yeah, you have to discern that, um, you know, yourself and then, of course, wh whoever is representing the church on the other side, um, if that's coming from the Lord or not. Um, yeah, because sometimes the Lord, um, you know, he, like, it's all in his providence, right? So he, he's called you to discern for, for a period of time. Um, but, but he really just wanted you to come to this place of surrender. I don't know, for example, mm -hmm. right? But that's actually what he, he wanted uh, for you in that 
And then now, like, it's pretty clear the doors are, are being closed. There's, um, you know, the, the, there are these obstacles in the way. Okay, that's not the, you you know, now you can go in a, in a different direction. Um, so things like that do happen. Um, but I wouldn't, like, overly focus on, oh, this is really, really easy, so it must be the Lord's will, or, oh, this is really, really hard, so it must not be the Lord's will, or it's really, really hard, it must be the Lord's will. That's also um, kind of a mis misconception sometimes, yeah. too. So, yeah. Um, yeah, to just just be open and, and to be listening to the Lord, but then also to be open with whoever your, um, you know, superior formator, um, vocation director, um, because the Lord um, is certainly working through them um, as well. Yeah. That's beautiful. That was just what I was going to say, even on, on the practical side of marriage, too. Just because it's easy doesn't mean that it's the right thing. Just because it's hard doesn't mean that it's the right thing. There will be difficulties regardless. Um, going back to what Father Ryan was saying too, sometimes it's just something that you yourself have to work out and deal out and deal with in yourself. And those just are going to happen throughout life. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all so much for, for sharing and being so generous with your time. Uh, Father Ryan, would you like to close us in, with prayer? Sure thing. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time together. Uh, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit into each of our hearts as we prepare to celebrate Pentecost this Sunday, but in a special way to send your Spirit into the hearts of these young people um, who are discerning your will for their life. Uh, hope to calm them, to give them peace in their discernment. Um, help them to truly receive their vocation, whether it be to married life or religious life or priestly life, to receive that vocation as a gift from you, uh, that you desire for their own happiness and fulfillment and holiness. Um, I ask you bless all those who participated in this discussion. Um, and uh, we pray for your blessing upon Mother Divine Grace and all her families and students. That together um, we'll offer Hail Mary, entrusting our vocations to our Mother Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Mother God. of God, pray for us pray sinners, for now and at the hour of our God. death. Amen. 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 And St. Philip Neri, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. Uh, this was a, a great year of career webinars wrapping up in, I think, the, the most perfect way. And um, for those of you who are not graduating, we will see you all next year. And for those of you who are graduating, know of our prayers for you as you, as you enter into this world, and we will be praying for your vocations and whatever God leads you to do. But thank you, Pastor Edmund. Thank you, Sister Anne. Thank you, Father Ryan. God bless you all, and we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.